I am really excited about today's video. I am pumped up about these Rebel Racing suspension bushings. And this probably isn't a video you were expecting, but I'll explain why I'm doing it now in just a moment. These are the suspension bushings for the front A-arms, and I wanna compare them to my stock rubber bushings. And I also wanna walk you through all the installation steps on how to get these on your car and why you wanna use them. So please, check it out. Garage time. I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Tom, I thought this was a budget build and you had a strict target. And yes, that is true. But I've also said that this project will never be done. It's always gonna be an evolution, phase after phase after phase. And there was no doubt in my mind that these bushings would be on the car someday because I believe in it. The reason why I'm pushing it forward now is because I wanna do some measurements of the rubber bushings and how they contribute to the how the suspension works and the total forces involved. Okay, one of the things that got me excited about this video is actually working on the 356. Remember a few videos ago, I did all the link pin and suspension removal, and I realized that, you know, these trailing arms, these are the 356 trailing arms, and they pivot on these needle bearings. This is a hard pivot. There's no rubber at all in the front of the 356 suspension, except for the sway bar, it has a little bit of rubber bushings in it. This product is, is really a modern variation on that. It doesn't use needle bearings, but it uses these amazing Teflon self-lubricating thermoplastics to function the same way. It's super low friction, but high precision, just like the 356. Now, a lot of guys will tell you that this product is going to give you a harsh ride because it's so rigid in its attachment to the car. My feeling is no, that's not true. The 356 does the same thing and the ride on the 356 is beautiful. Nobody complains about the harshness of the 356. Okay, it is not necessary to remove the entire strut, but I'm gonna be removing this strut so I can do some testing on the arm before I remove the arm. Most of this is gonna be really easy to remove because all this is sort of finger tight because it's been removed before. Okay, next up is this pinch bolt here where the strut attaches to the ball joint. So I'm just gonna loosen that up and push out the bolt. Before I take that nut off, I'm gonna hammer it out with a block of wood. Removing the strut is not needed if you're doing just the bushings, but I'm doing a little bit more testing on this. That's why I'm removing it, and this car has not been aligned. This will mess up your alignment if your car is already aligned. Now I'm gonna remove the torsion bar so I can look at the effect of just the rubber on the suspension.
And this ball joint has not been off before and obviously it's way harder than all the other stuff I removed. So I'm gonna look at a way to use a breaker bar as opposed to the impact wrench because it's eating up the uh, nut. I, I cut this tube to go over the ball joint and a plate on top so I can clamp the socket onto the ball joint. So that'll just keep it all together. This is where it's about to get geeky. Now, some of you guys may remember this contraption. This is what I use to measure the strut bar forces. And I've just repurposed that here. So I've taken this portion off and I've attached the end of the load cell right to my suspension arm. And then it's connected up all the way to my ceiling. So this is going all the way up into the rafters of my ceiling. So I'm gonna be pulling on this with this ratchet strap. You guys know I love to geek out on this stuff, but I promise you I did not spend a ton of time getting this rig set up. I'm not too concerned about these forces. You know, I'm going to be eliminating these bushings, but just for the sake of comparison, I wanted to measure them and kind of document what those numbers might be. Okay, the computer is recording data right now on the uh, load cell in real time. And I got some tape measure stuff here to try to measure how much the arm goes up versus how much force it develops. So I just kind of increase the force here on the ratchet strap. Oops. I got to start this camera too. All right, two cameras, same time, super advanced. Here we go. I got to reset now the, um, the dial indicator. I'm getting a phone call right in the middle of my experiment. Okay, let's keep deflecting it up. Okay, that's at least two inches of travel. I mean, that's more than the suspension mo mo normally would move. Two inches would be pretty severe. I'm gonna release the force and see if it goes back to normal. Yeah, it doesn't look like the arm went back to its original position, which means the bearings did slip. And I'm gonna do this one more time. This time I'm not gonna use the ratchet strap because the force wasn't quite as big as I thought. So I am going to just lift it by hand, try to get smoother action instead of the jerking up and down. And just as soon as this goes one inch, I'm going to release the pressure. Right there. This is the end. And it did not return back to zero, even on one inch. Here are the results of the first test. And this is with the ratchet strap. So you see a lot of motion up and down every time the ratchet would load and unload. This is where I reset it. And then here's more loading and unloading of the 
load cell with the ratchet strap. So this is the force on this axis and this is the time it took. But I also looked at the video and I know that this was a travel of one inch when I reset the thing. And then this is another travel of one inch. Here's where the video showed it wasn't actually measuring on the dial indicator. So these last two clicks weren't actually being measured in terms of distance. So this is one inch, this is one inch. Distance between here is like 30 pounds. The total extreme was about um, 40 pounds. So what's important here is kind of the slope of the line. And I realize it's kind of messy with the ratchet strap. That's why I did it again with my arms. But I got a slope of 30 pounds per inch. That's kind of the equivalent spring rate or wheel rate that you would get just due to the bushings, 30 pounds per inch. And then over here, it was a little different. I'm not sure if this is because the bushing was slipping or if it's just the way I measured it, but this one's 20 pounds per inch. This is the time where I just use my arms. It's not that much force. So this was about, you know, same thing, 30 pounds. I just using my arms and my knee kind of. And the force is a little more stable. So this I figured was an inch from start to finish. From here to here was about an inch. And there's really two different slopes. As I started, it was sloping at about 32 pounds per inch pretty stiff to begin with. And then I think the bushing started slipping. So it started reducing the slope a little bit. Here the slope was only 16 pounds per inch. The reason why I measured that is I wanted to compare those numbers with that of the torsion bar rates. Now you can go to online calculators or people on Pelican Parts, Will Furch for example, has posted all the wheel rates for given torsion bar sizes. So for the stock torsion bar 18.9, or 19 millimeters roughly, the wheel rate is 110 pounds per inch. So every time you move up an inch in wheel travel, it generates another 110 pounds. The bushings are like 30 pounds per inch. So that's like 30% of the spring force is due to the bushings. Now what that means is, like in my case, the bushings are old and they're slipping. So if one slips, it's going to kick in at a different rate than the torsion bar because they're not synchronized. You're gonna sort of get some funky results. You're gonna lose all your corner balance settings because if you, say on a cold day, you pull out of your driveway and one wheel happens to, you know, take more of a, of a load than the other wheel, that bushing slips, either it's wet weather, you know, you never know when it's gonna slip, but once it does, it kicks in at a different time and you could have one wheel you know, minus 30 pounds, the other wheel plus 30 pounds, and your corner balance is no longer going to be uh, accurate until the bushings decide to change again. So the unpredictable nature of the rubber bushings is what I'm trying to eliminate. And thankfully, Rebel Racing has the product to do that. And that's why I was excited about this video. Modern technology in an old car, which this is what this car is. It's a resto mod, total resto mod. Oh, also, according to uh, Will Furch, the uh, wheel rate for the next size up, it kind of skips by, uh, there's no 20 millimeter. Uh, 21 was the next size he had on there, was 173 pounds. So going to the Rebel Racing bushings is almost like dropping um, two millimeters on torsion bar size. Not quite, it's probably more like one millimeter, maybe one and a half, but these are old bushings. Imagine if the bushings are brand new and they're not slipping as much they're going to contribute a lot more than 30 pounds per inch. And that is the unpredictable nature of these things. When they're new, they're gonna be super stiff. After you've done 10, 20,000 miles, they might break into the point where, you know, they're, they're feeling like around, you know, 30 pounds or I don't know, maybe it's 50 pounds. And then at the end of the life of like mine, they start to slip and you get something like 12 pounds. I promise this is the last thing I was gonna say on the bushings but I got this roll of paper towels and my, my breaker bar. And what I measured was ideal conditions, just moving the arm up and down. Well, the suspension arm also has to handle all the braking loads and the cornering loads. So now maybe you're taking a corner and the load on the bushings is now taking another side load. So you can see how, how it deflects the paper towels going like this. So now it has to, control the suspension arm and it has to pivot. Now, when this is being compressed between here, it's gonna probably give you a different spring rate than it was when I just lifted it with my arms because I'm not turning in that case, I'm just spinning. 
So now when you're braking or turning, you're compressing and you're spinning, that's going to give you a totally different spring rate. All right, I'm off my soapbox now. Let's get these bushings in the car and see how smooth they are. Okay, the arm is removed. This is where those rubber bushings are, right underneath this collar. And then this is on the front part. A bushing is right there. That's the rubber piece right there. So we gotta pull these off and replace it with the Rebel Racing. The easiest way for me to remove these bushings is to heat them up a little bit, which softens them even more, and then they should slip right off. You can see how distorted it is. Definitely more load on one side than the other. Rebel Racing recommends that we, uh, you know, clean this up really well and scuff it up a little bit with some 60 grit or 80 grit. And then this portion here, actually this is stainless steel, this gets um, JB welded onto the arm. So that's why it needs to be really clean and prepared on both surfaces for this to be permanently attached. Now, I can see a problem already. This arm has a dent in it, so I need to straighten that out. So this, this bushing is not going all the way down onto its flange here because it's all bent. Here's the portion that I just straightened out and you can see this sleeve makes nice contact all the way around, which, uh, you know, there's gonna be some forces in this direction. So you, you want it to seat properly against this stop. This is wax and grease remover. <laughs> Before I glue these on, I'm just going to slide these on and slip it in the car and just see how it fits without the gluing it on. This slid right in, no problems. And here I'm just snugging up the bolts, finger tight, and seeing how the arm pivots. It's nice and loose with the bolts loose. And now I'm tightening the front bolts and then the rear bolts pretty tight and seeing how it affects the motion of the arm. The manual said you are allowed to put a few washers in the front to try to get the two bushings in complete linear alignment. I found that one washer on the front of both bolts seemed to give it the best feel. The kit also came with these really cool um, spherical washers. This housing can can rotate a little bit. It has a little bit of freedom. Uh, these are quite thick, like thicker than the washers that I needed to use. So because I spent so much time aligning my suspension pan and making sure everything was level, I feel like I might not need this floating feature because without it, it's pretty, pretty smooth. But these are a really cool feature if your suspension pan is a little out of whack. So one more final clean and we'll get it done. Okay, 
Okay, before the, uh, the JB Weld is fully dried, I installed it on the car and snugged up the bolts so that it dries in a sort of collinear place. Um, I was very careful not to get any JB Weld on the exterior of the sleeve, so it's not gonna cement itself to the bushings. Okay, the car's now back down on its wheels under its own weight, even though it's on these tire stands. The instructions say to loosen up the front bearing with the weight of the car on the suspension. The front bearing holes are slotted, so you wanna hammer the bushing all the way back towards the rear so there's no end play in, this, in the front A-arm. Last thing to do is install the skid plate uh, protector thing. My car is a 74 and it has these big skid plates on it. So because the front bushing housing is a little thicker, it's CNC machined aluminum, I need to space out the front bolts. So that's it, one side's complete. I still need to go back and torque everything. Everything is still mostly finger tight. This car is not a driver. So before I do drive it, I gotta torque lots of things like the steering rack. The other side's gonna go a lot quicker. I think I can do the other side in probably three hours or less. The only chance it would rattle would be if the chassis is flexing a lot or if you're going over like a cattle grate or something really rapid, then you might get a little bit of you know, jittery vibrations in the bearings. But on regular driving, when you're cornering or braking or just driving down the highway, all the forces are going up on the bearings. They're not going to cycle up and down or rattle up and down. So now the car is suspended by the torsion bars only. Torsion bars made out of steel are not going to be inconsistent. The consistency is the same, whether it's wet conditions, dry conditions, whether it's cold, whether it's warm, Nothing changes the steel properties. So it's gonna be the same until the day the torsion bar breaks. The rates don't change. It's consistent. There's no stiction, no variability. It's gonna be easier to do alignments. And overall, I'm really excited about this product. Choosing your torsion bars, you might wanna be careful about using high durometer rubber with like two millimeter bigger bars. I mean, that's going to probably give a lot more force than you were expecting. Thanks again for watching. And don't forget, if you are interested in learning more about TIG welding, I offer a comprehensive TIG welding course on sheet metal. Please check it out. The link is in the description below and have a great week, you guys. Take care.